Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you're here as a new follower from the absolute storm I stirred up on Twitter. I want to say something else, but I know you're not supposed to swear in the first couple of minutes, so um, I'll avoid doing that. But hopefully you're a new listener and hopefully you stick around because episode 300 is coming up on Friday. But you're not here for episode 300. You will be, but you're not tonight. You're here for episode number 299. Um, this guest was on my other podcast last week, and... Um, he, much like me, is very, very impassioned about the topics that he talks about, and I could tell that he has a very, very deep knowledge on um, the things we're going to talk about today, about big banks, the Federal Reserve, and Jerome Powell. And I've been kind of meaning to dig into this stuff, so I think it's going to be a really, really good show. Um, hopefully you all enjoy. So, as usual, you can find all the links to find my guest below. You can find the great Tiger Fitness at the links below. My protein powder literally shipped out yesterday. A little bit late, but I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. I, you know, as I always say, I borderline, you know, use exclusively Tiger Fitness stuff. You can find everything you need from there. I'm drinklmnt.com slash in liberty and health. And then Fox and Sons Coffee. Use code Kyle at checkout to get some of their fantastic coffee. And um, I guess with that, let's rock and roll. What is up, everybody? My name is Kyle Matovic. I am the host of the In Liberty and Health podcast, where we talk all things liberty, health and wellness, and beyond. My hope is to encourage and spread the message of liberty, and physical and mental well-being. I hope you enjoy all the topics we talk about with our guests. We're on all major streaming platforms, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Man, I'm doing as good as anyone can do getting buried by his 13-year-old son on leg day. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for not being on this podcast because I got to go see Metallica. So if that's a problem, kiss my ass. Oh, okay? yeah. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the show, my friend, Phil Gibson. How you doing, brother? Kyle, what's up, dude? I'm stoked to be on here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, uh, as I said in the introduction, you were on a uh, five till midnight, and um, when you get going, man, you're you're kind of like me. When you're impassioned and well read on the topic, you could just go and go and go and go. And um, I, I didn't want to seem rude on five till midnight, but I wanted to get you on here to kind of let you run a little bit more free. Um, we tried to keep a little bit of a tighter ship over there in regards to like time limit and all that stuff, but I wanted to kind of dive into this with you. And as I said in the introduction as well, um, the whole obsession with Jerome Powell has been interesting for me. But um, before we kind of get going down there, why don't you let everybody know who you are and what you do? If streaming video games when everyone leaves is considered a tighter ship, then uh, that's definitely raising the bar. <laughs> no, I had a great time. I'm just fucking with you. Yeah. So what's up, guys? My name is Phil Gibson. If you haven't heard of me, my handle or at on Twitter. Yes, I will dead name Twitter. Fuck you, Elon. Just kidding. I love Elon. Don't don't love him, but I appreciate him. My, my Twitter is Mr. Sue, M-R-P-S-E-U. I, for a while, had a podcast called The pseudo lectual podcast and like a lot of guests that kyle has on and like kyle himself i came from the libertarian angle of things uh that was around 2017 and just over time you just learned that you're just more conservative than you really think i i don't even know what to call it anymore it's just right right wing as we've come to learn, thanks to Pete Keonas, which funnily enough, my ideology seemed to change with his and as his show changed as well. So I don't do uh, the intellectual podcast anymore, or I called it a boy named Sue, PSEU, of course. And right now I just kind of write about monetary policy, macro, geopolitics, some cult cultural stuff, but a huge emphasis on the whole monetary policy Jerome Powell, the American Patriot versus the globalists, essentially. And I am also a musician like Kyle. That was really my first love interest. And I do that on occasion as well. I've got a band camp, just Phil Gibson dot band camp, camp whatever. Uh, like Kyle, I'm assuming that Kyle did his own music for a show in the intro. Is that yes. true? <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, so that was actually uh, funny enough. The first song I ever fully wrote with uh, my band now 
uh, a crown, crown and uh that uh I, I remember my singer when we were <laughs> writing that song she's like i'm hearing something and she like sung out the melody da, 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 and then i'm like okay hold on i got it and then i played it and we kind of like the other guitar player had like this one riff and then we just kind of blew it up and that became the title track of our first ep the first ep i ever recorded the reckoning the song's called the reckoning nice <laughs> but yeah, I, I do the, the the same thing. The uh, self with the capital S song when you see on my Bandcamp, that's the intro that plays in my podcast. Now somewhat defunct, but the same old RSS feed to the old episodes is on the Substack. So the Substack is Q Paul Q P O L, which stands for Quiet Parts Out Loud, where I I tr try to do exactly that. But we're here to talk about some of that stuff, and I will say full you know upfront. This is not financial advice. I don't have a series six, uh, seven, no 63 working on the SAE and eventually 63. Hopefully I can take those on my own and not need a FINRA uh, member firm to sponsor me. But mm -hmm. I, um, I also sit on the shoulders of giants too. Like a lot of people that will claim to have opinions. They're influenced by a lot of other people that are smarter than them. And my job I feel is just to try to diminish all the the noise trim off the fat and just tell it to you how i see it in layman's no bullshit terminology so i'm gonna do my damnedest to do that here <laughs> nice well i i really like that uh perspective because um i i truly feel the same way that uh we all do stand on the shoulders of giants um uh, of somebody that you might be familiar with and i'm sure you probably like and know uh dan mcadams i've seen a lot of people throwing shit his way recently but uh he's one of those giants that i feel that we stand on the shoulders of and when it comes to nutrition for myself um i try to come into the liberty sphere and spread nuanced information when it comes to nutrition because i feel like a lot of people get led astray with bullshit and i think that's kind of what you're attempting to do when it comes to the economic stuff so maybe we could kind of start there um I, and i want to throw out the caveat like the first couple of people who really got me interested in economics i, I would say thomas Sowell was probably one of the people which i'm sure that's you know you hear that a lot thomas Sowell's is probably like a big um you know advocate for not necessarily free market economics but more like the chicago school of economics and then eventually i think a lot of libertarians kind of find their way over to peter schiff who i know <laughs> um you know guys like you and um tom longo aren't quite a big fan of but um I, I, the, the reason why i like peter schiff is because i think he's the biggest advocate for austrian economics today and i think them, that can yeah. That, that gets a lot of people over to your direction because um, I was listening to you on Biting the Bullet and um, they kind of, you know, started to talk around or you started to talk about how it's a uh, perpetual collapse without a lot of nuance when it comes to, like the Peter Schiff or the run of the mill Austrian ec ec economist perspective. So, yeah, their perspective is yeah. that they're eventually going to be right when they mm -hmm. just sell you doom porn. Same thing that Zero Hedge does. And they just... Right they make their money and their ad revenue on their pages by just shitting on the fed, blaming the government, like rightfully so it's mm -hmm. a bullshit Keynesian system. But if you look more into the nuanced Machiavellian approach, fight power with power, get control of that power and then turn things around with these institutions propped up on bullshit, whether they are or not, then it's about getting the right people in charge. And okay, I know so like real quick. anarchists and minarchists will argue, Oh, that's bullshit. Well, I mean, we're, it, whether or not like you read the fourth turning i really didn't but i got like the clip notes of everyone else yeah. bitching about it that's kind of where we are and p things are going to go in cycles i've been listening to pete's read on john c calhoun's uh inquisition on not inquisition disquisition on government i fucked that word up but this is essentially like we okay. go from monarchy to democracy to monarchy again looks like that's kind of where we're going and it's all about the people that are in charge and the people that are fighting against them that are also elites in power that are fed up with how things are working right now. And so they're just, just going to pull the levers of power, not perhaps in altruistic fashion, but rational fashion to where I can't run my business this way. There's so much inefficiency in this managerial state and this bureaucracy. And that's what I think Powell has done with his monetary policy, with his Fed. He's not a globalist banker like Bernanke and Yellen. And okay, well, I kind of give green yeah, oh, sorry. No, 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 you're okay. You're okay. I, I, I kind of want to start from Pow there because, like, like yeah. I said, I've this has been something that's interested me, and 
I'm very, very ignorant. And I want to make sure that my viewers and myself kind of get like the full spectrum on this because sure. I, I know you're super, super well read on this. And I want, like I said, I want to make sure that the listeners get the, the most out of us that they can. Okay. Cool. So, um, Jerome Powell was appointed by Trump in what was it? 2019 or 18, something like that. Okay. I, I didn't do like a forensic history on the dude. I read <laughs> okay. maybe well, Wikipedia well, yeah. on him like a couple of years ago. But what's interesting sure. is that he is a Jesuit. At least he went to a Jesuit school, but he's an eighth generation Virginian. So eighth generation America. He comes from that cloth. Mm. He's aristocracy. He is a lawyer, which some people call liars, rightfully so. But he yeah. also comes from private equity. So he has experience in the markets. Unlike a lot of these As, other Fed guys, okay. he does not have a PhD. And if you read Danielle DiMartino's book, she's a great follow, one of the giants of the shoulders that I stand on. She was at the Fed for nine years, came from Wall Street, had actual market experience. And these PhD assholes basically just like blow each other's load and like fluff each other up on their their fancy schmancy articles and essays, which mm. is just, you know, purporting Keynesian models and thinking this is how we're going to run the economy jerome Powell actually comes from getting his, his hands dirty in the markets uh yeah, private mm -hmm. equity they call him private equity pal for a reason came from m a the m a world i didn't really i, I want to get deeper into the history of like solomon brothers going down but it was just another you know globalist jewish family uh fun <laughs> that was uh i believe trying to corner the treasury markets and as the lawyer that he is, I think that's kind of the role that he was serving. He was on that trial, basically like chewing them out, fishing them out. These are all the laws that they broke. So he's now appointed. Uh, actually, he got on the FOMC board under the Obama administration. So he knows how to play both sides. Like he's very Machiavellian, uh, kind of apolitical. He just knows he's a he's a businessman. He's effective. And so he was a, he was able to schmooze his way up to the FOMC board and get appointed by Obama, and then. Uh, I think that was in like 2012 and in 2018 or 19 or whatever uh, it was 18. I believe he was wanted uh, to chair FOMC chair by Trump in 2018. And so Danielle DiMartino Booth, DDB, as I call her, she makes the argument all the time that pal pri private equity pal could be worth hundreds of billions of dollars and he doesn't need to be here. And she's basically pointing out and has said he's just an American patriot because he sees the fiscal rot and chaos and just, you know, grave that America is digging itself in. And I think what better way to turn that around is to one, raise interest rates to make the, the projects and pork and globalization, funding of wars, printing money willy nilly to overthrow gov governments and elections, make that too expensive for these people. Okay. And you do that by raising interest rates, essentially. Okay, and so... The only way that he's stopped is, frankly, if he's assassinated. So okay. God <laughs> well, willing, let's... that doesn't happen, that he's got the uh, best, you know, uh, mafia bodyguards surrounding him. But that's essentially what <laughs> Pell's doing. But yeah, he okay. worked his way up through schmoozing both political aisles. He's where he's at now. He doesn't have to be where he's at now. His private mm -hmm. equity buddies from the world that he came from keep calling him and saying, yo, dude, lower interest rates. We're dying here. And he's saying no. He, or he's not answering the phones. He's using the bullshit data and the market uh, statistical narratives as a buffer, as an excuse to hide behind to keep doing his hire for longer. So he's going to use bad data to get the job done to basically bankrupt all the bad actors in the economy that only benefit and prosper during zero interest rate policy or ZERP, which was the Ben Bernanke doctrine when Ben right. Bernanke was chair of the Federal Reserve in 2008. And mm -hmm. this is really the beginning of QE, quantitative easing. And the Bernanke doctrine was we cannot, the Fed, buy assets off of banks, large institutions, whatever, unless if interest rates are zero. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you don't need a central bank of your country, if you think about it. Because what is the point? Money's free. Yeah. What, like, what's the point? You might as well just have what we had during COVID and those bailouts when it was just money directly from the government to you. Okay, that okay. Well, what quick, a CBDC yeah. would turn uh, okay. into. Okay, well, so, I'm almost done. I'm almost done with this. Sorry. And <laughs> so 
Pell is recorded saying in transcripts on the FOMC meeting before he was chair in 2012 saying, we can't have this. He basically said verbatim what I just said. Mm -hmm. And so that's the guy who's not cut from the same cloth as Bernanke and Yellen. Yellen is a different and almost worse story because she was the Federal Reserve president of the uh, 8th district, I think. No, no, 12th district in um in, of the San Francisco Fed. The San Francisco Fed, may I m remind people that yeah. there are 12 regional Fed banks throughout the country, right? Mm -hmm. Not all of the presidents of each of those banks think and believe the same shit. The districts, the San Francisco Fed district covers the most amount of states in the country. I think it's like 20 something states and it's basically in charge kind of like a like a market director if you think about in any other industry federal, federal reserve bank of san francisco is like the market director of like 20 some maybe it's like 18 or 12 country, uh states in the country including like alaska and um uh, hawaii and stuff like that but basically they're able to make easier monetary policy i mean silicon valley for example you don't have all these bullshit pork companies uh, creating products that nobody desires and money's not free. And you, it's San Francisco Fed policy, which create institutions like Silicon Valley Bank, like FTX, and you have that collapse. You basically have these zombie companies that shouldn't exist in the first place, getting preferential treatment from the uh, district banks that uh, reside over them. And it just kind of goes hand in hand. You've heard these the uh, analogy before that every bad policy in government starts in California and then works its way East. Mm -hmm. And the same thing applies for monetary policy. Monetary policy is what drives those bad ideas. Cause that's what funds it. And you can go to the pinned tweet on my Twitter that I make the argument that because raising rates was happening under Powell, Silicon Valley bank was taken out uh or ftx was taken out as a hit job by done by the fed under jerome powell to basically get rid of this offshore dollar creation uh slash money laundering for political campaigns most nominally the democrats mm -hmm. via stable coins or crypto in general through ftx people have done political forensics of the relationships between sam bankman fried and Gary Gensler and whoever else and their family ties. I didn't get that autistic about it because I didn't really care about it that much. I just assumed and I assumed right. But that's essentially uh, what happened. So we saw Silicon Valley Bank go down last year and Silicon Valley Bank was basically, uh, to call it a bank is kind of uh, too generous. Uh, I think it's another one of those projects that lobbied to uh, get a, a bank charter and its business was essentially giving out loans to, again, these bullshit Sil Silicon Valley companies that only prospered and would exist during zero interest rate policy. And so for the Fed to just come in and raise rates and have all those go tits up and essentially do a M&A merger and acquisition deal uh, for that, uh, it's, it's basically a mafia boss thing. And the same thing with First Republic. Uh, sure, that was like one casualty, but it's just you can just see it as sure call it a monster, uh, just taking out its globalist competitors and um, just taking the good assets on on the balance sheet. So I kind of digest, but I'm just trying to give like examples of sure. that that have happened that mm -hmm. we can just apply the theory and just point to it. And you know, do your Charlie Day thing of you know the red thread and to oh, you know, I see. Okay, yeah, right. It's just like I think a tangible example of people's incentives and who's at play and who's getting in the way of their goals. You can't have free money in a prosperous society, mm -hmm. and Jerome Powell's not a globalist, and he's not going to be the Federal Reserve Bank of the entire world because that's what these people, as Tom Longo calls the Davos crowd. Um, so those are the Europeans, and then you have another faction over there in Europe, or actually it, the UK. British Empire never died, people. Uh, just FYI, 
if you think it did, you're fucking full of shit or you're lying to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, what really happened is that they exported their military to the United States and they hide behind the, the ruse that, oh, poor little United Kingdom can't be all big and bad and macho. Our monetary policy was tied to the British crown up until 2022. When we left LIBOR, Google that. It's just a bullshit index debt and in, debt indexing rate that was man manipulated. Also led to money being freer than it should have been, and we left it and we re-indexed our U.S. debt to SOFR, the secured overnight financing rate, which is actually backed by tangible market data transactions between large institutions in the U.S. is based off of something real, maybe not free markets. That's never really existed, like it or not, libertarians, but. Uh, we basically don't have a globalist debt indexing rate dictating how much the cost of American money should be. Back then, under LIBOR, when it was decided at the City of London, everyone should kind of, you know, know enough or have an idea of why the City of London as an entity is demonic, bad. Uh, why, under LIBOR, everyone's debt in the world, that was kind of like the benchmark. And... Everyone was tied to it. Your credit cards, your mortgage, all your shit was tied to LIBOR. Dictated by some central planners will get on a Zoom call in the city of London and say, hey, we're going to charge it as this. You can Google LIBOR scandals and whatnot. It, it was bad, okay? It was bad. So basically, if there was like a credit snafu uh, over across the pond and rates went up, then you would actually feel that in Oklahoma, Texas, fucking wherever in your credit cards and your mortgage. And so it was kind of like a socialist like ball and chain that we were tied to to bail them out, essentially, if you think about it. And that's not the case under Powell. Now, people wanted to implement SOFR during Obama, but Obama being one of the globalist you know, douches that he is, and he said no. And so it was thanks to uh, Jerome Powell, but also John Williams, who's the president of the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which that's where monetary policy is dictated because, I mean, New York is really the capital of capital markets of the entire world kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, again, you kind of have like these sovereigntists, call them white hats, if you will, saying that we're going to turn shit around. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to have the, 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 this isn't non, there are rules sort of mentality. But uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much the um, British empire, which it never died, and there wasn't a true declaration of independence until Sofer came along. And uh, just the British Empire, if we'll be honest, uh, still probably heavily ran by Rothschilds and other adjacents. Uh, I I firmly believe that when the Rothschilds like got into power, and it's not just the Rothschilds are probably one of the main families of that ilk, but when they got into power and uh, uh, whatever Meyer Rothschild, like the grandfather, godfather of that, that whole lineage. When he was on the up and up, he had all of his sons go to Europe. Everyone probably knows the story that's listening to this. But they basically lived rent-free in the pockets of kings. It's a little phrase I came up with, which basically they were the ones that were taking care of their gold and financing everything for each country, and that's how you're able to finance war. And so once every kingdom monarchy was starting to collapse. It's kind of like they like went and uh, pump and dumped each European country where they pumped and pump and dumped and destroyed the monarchy there. Cause that was the end goal to create some sort of like democracy parliamentary kind of uh, uh, pre I'm trying to think of a word. Fuck it. You know what I'm trying to say, but um, the last remaining empire that was standing was the British empire. And so, I kind of think that, uh, you know, that, sure, I'll call it Jewish aristocracy lineage. It's still running shit. Okay. All right. All right. So Jeez, it, it, that, that's it, is, a it is easy and valid to say that it is the British Empire still running things. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we could argue it's not really them. It's kind of who that we're all kind of thinking. However, the British Empire, as it still exists, the, the crown does like to hide behind people like us or on any political faction blaming things on the Jews. So I think that they see that as like a advantageous scapegoat. One of them, 
the other blaming that uh, well, we're not the empire, the big mean American empire is. And you'll see people in the dissident right or libertarians or, again, other adjacent uh, fellow tra travelers, but also people on, on the left. Uh, they, they'll just blame, oh, big bad American empire. It's all America's fault, blah, blah, blah. No, America has still been serving the crown. That's essentially what the neoconservatives were. They were Trotskyites, the Red Revolution in Russia, during slash world war one and two uh because remember we partnered with like the wrong enemy during world war two mm -hmm. it was all british <laughs> british mi6 mm -hmm. uh strategy and so they've been hiding behind uh different veils ever since okay. kind of went on a tangent my apologies sorry, no no no, sorry. no no that's okay that's okay there's there's so much there that i wanted to get into um, I, I guess first thing first, the, the thing I wrote down because I was, was trying to follow along, but like I said, it's it's a lot. Um, so my problem with this whole Powell theory, especially when it comes to him wanting to stick it to the globalist bankers, I, I don't know how you explain 2020 when we flooded the world with U.S. dollars and literally everyone heard the stat of 80% of the dollars ever printed yep. were printed from like 2020 to 2021. Okay. So how does that fit with being an American patriot when, I mean, so, it's, it's no secret that that would cause Americans undue suffering. I mean, we're feeling it today. Yeah. So Powell didn't want to do that, but really didn't have a choice because one, sure. what the fuck else would you do when the country economy that everyone in the world kind of relies on is going tits up? Nobody benefits BRICS, uh, anyone in Europe. Like, nobody benefits when the United States goes tits up. Now, there are some factions that do. That is what Davos and like the British Empire slash neocons want, but they wanted to have that done on their own time, right? So you have that. Nobody benefits when the U United States goes broke, no matter really like how much gold they have and everything, because you're going to have to like, start over and all that. Um so you do it one for confidence bailing out people for confidence bailing out the biggest largest institutions for confidence because and i'll probably get into this in some other concept later in, in this conversation you don't need to be a good financial global actor like your balance sheet doesn't have to be perfect mm -hmm. like we are in 30. Is it kind of like the uh, the cleanest dirty shirt in the hamper kind of yeah, deal? Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. And, but not only that, all you have to be is better than everyone else. And cleanest so, dirty I, shirt in the hamper. Yeah. But sure. I, I think like better than everyone else really kind of just throws it in your brain like better conceptually because no one else like at the end of the day everything is kind of yes i mentioned like libor and like so for now but everything like debt financials like your mortgage all this is kind of indexed based on reliant on like the u.s 10-year treasury right? right and i know that the yield curve is inverted right now thanks to globalists like janet yellen helping out uh christine lagarde at the european central bank they're fed um by making u.s debt less attractive on on the uh, short term than the long term whatever i don't need to get into that but essentially powell basically had to save the system so some so that the world has some credibility and trust in their portfolio in their debt uh yes i understand that people in the BRICS nations like china will buy our debt and they'll sell a shit ton here and there but essentially like they will buy it back so they can save it. It appreciates. They make, make their money on their coupons, whatever. Because, uh, again, it's like full faith and credit in the United States. And this is exactly what saved the U.S. economy during the Great Depression. Uh, frankly, was the FDIC. As much as it's easy and rightfully so to shit on FDR by socializing fucking everything in, in the system. Uh, as the monarch that he served as for 12 years or whatever the fuck it was. Uh, that's essentially all it is. So same thing happened in 2008 with QE, same thing that happened with the bank term funding program, which by the way, wasn't really a bailout because you had to pay the debt back at prevailing interest rates. And you also, as a bank, were forced to raise capital 
to take the uh, quote unquote bailout institution money from the Fed through the bank term funding rate. This is the thing that was created as the buffer during Silicon Valley Bank and all this shit. But these these programs, these solutions are created in order to maintain trust and prevent chaos from happening and having a French Re Revolution type scenario. Also, why did Powell do it? Because Creating this credibility and saving the system was going to be helpful for him to get reelected. He was up for reelection as Fed chair. Okay. Okay. All right. Um. So now so I guess he's the... playing a political game that he's being dealt. Okay. Yeah. Did, okay. So basically, to, and one yeah. more thing, one last point. Best things come in threes. Third point is that <laughs> it doesn't really fucking matter how much money you print. Like, yeah, it does, but it's not so much about the stock as much as the flow. Because that money's going to have to go somewhere. And this is the genius of what Jerome Powell did. This is was the big fucking brain blast that I learned from Tom Luongu, who I am proud to call a friend and mentor and person I fucking... Uh, not only... Uh, I don't want to say idolize. He's like... People call themselves Rothbardians. I call myself a Luongan, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I... I uh, shamelessly like plagiarize. I mean, I give him credit every time, but I, <laughs> I'm very much a student of him. As long but as you give credit, it, then it's all fair. Always, always. Um, and he s supports my subject too. So he's the man, but the genius thing that I learned from him going back to the whole, you know, it's about stock versus flow. What Jerome Powell did in 2021 June after the June FOMC meeting is that he raised interest rates by five basis points on this one very uh, esoteric institution in the financial markets. And that's called the reverse repo. Uh, repos are basically overnight loans that primary dealers institutions in the financial markets do to each other overnight because, you know, you need money overnight to, you know, clear out your, your books and balance your shit. So what happens when you raise the reverse repo let, let me just explain what a repo is. Repo means repurchase. It it okay. uh, um it requires two transactions. You borrow uh if you're a bank going to a, a primary dealer or whatever, two banks borrow x amount of money uh for one night, but so that's the money's one transaction. The other end of the transaction is that they post collateral, so like a treasury. This is kind of like how swaps uh, uh, the discount window at the Fed work, right? Fed gives cash to the bank. Bank has assets on their balance sheet. They use those assets, usually treasuries, as collateral for said cash. So um, the uh, so that they uh, the Fed purchases the uh, cash, or no, the, the Fed purchases the asset from the bank. Right, so that's one purchase, and then gives them the money in exchange, and then at the end of the day, they uh, swap back. So a reverse repo is when the Fed basically like takes in the money and not the cash. So basically, just think of it as like getting five basis points more interest, parking your all the cash that you have on your balance sheet at the Fed. So by raising that institution by five basis points. That was basically the best deal that you could get on your money anywhere else in the private markets. So it moved like a trillion dollars globally overnight, which sunk the euro. Because again, this is kind of like a globalist battle between the Fed versus the ECB or the European Central Bank, their Fed. Mm -hmm. And the euro is a bullshit abomination created in 2000, I think, because the European Union, the EU, as a concept, is only 24 years old. And they're the ones that essentially want to collapse uh, capitalism, like commercial banking as it stands, get rid of all the banks and just have like one globalist bank uh, do MMT right into your wallet and control all your, mm -hmm. your spending and all this shit. So uh, Powell raising this rate moves all the stock of money into the Fed and basically drained a bunch of capital accounts. Uh, globally and it really fucked over the globalists in europe and this is essentially how he dealt with the inflation that he printed during covid and this institution the reverse repo institution wasn't created uh until actually it wasn't i think it already existed 
But the first conceptual implementation of something like this was called the IOER or, or interest on excess reserves. Cause that's essentially what I explained is you're getting interest on excess mm -hmm. cash reserves that you have. And it was created by Ben Bernanke during that all the, okay, so that during all the, all the, the excess, money, all, yeah, the, all that, the money, all the money printing that happened in 2008 yeah. during that GFC bailout, Bernanke had to deal with, you know, well, uh, of all the stock and money is going to flood into the economy. We're going to have hyperinflation. So how am I going to deal with this? I'm going to raise the, IOER interest on excess reserves uh, institution by 25 basis points. So just think of the power that Powell has now. It took 25 basis points. So that's a quarter of, of a percent that you're getting on your money to move all this money out of the economy to prevent hyperinflation. And now today it only took five basis points. Okay. For Powell. Okay, so to move the, trillions of dollars to prevent hyperinflation. So those uh, the basically it's more about like where's the money going, not how yeah. much is printed. Okay, and so ideally what, money is going to, as Tom says, go to ground into tan tangible things and safe havens that actually matter: gold, okay. commodities, Bitcoin, that shit. Okay, so that uh, cash on extra reserves is that kind of like that? Is that kind of what you mentioned when basically Reverse banks are looking? Though. So, yeah, the reverse repo. That's when like they're just trying to kind of clear their books and they're trying to send that cash somewhere to gain interest on it. Um, well, reverse re re repo and reverse repo is just like mm -hmm. an overnight trade. Uh, but yeah. what I should have emphasized and better deline delineated, delineated, whatever, is that You're it pissed. was happening at the Fed. So okay, and the Fed is the so basically the, the Fed would have to pay out the interest, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So basically, Americans were getting screwed in their purchasing power because they were having to pay out um, dollars on interest from other banks all around. I mean, the world. they Is weren't that... getting screwed. The Fed just raised their interest payout. Well, but but like before five, that, before it wasn't that. about getting screwed. It was about Powell saying, "Hey, how do I deal with all this money that I printed that I was forced to by Congress because these uh -huh. globalists use COVID as a hit job against." the monetary tightening that I'm trying to do. Because remember, he tried to raise rates in 2018, but he couldn't because of like all the debt. He didn't have all the the financial like levers pulled yet because we were still mm -hmm. on LIBOR for one. One of the main yeah. reasons why we are at five and a half percent as the Fed benchmark rate, that's not the Fed funds rate, it's actually different. The Fed dictates the uh, discount rate. Sorry, it's not mm -hmm. benchmark, it's called discount. When the Fed raises rates, every FOMC meeting or if they decide to not raise rates, whatever they are raising the discount rate that is called mm -hmm. like when banks go to get money from the fed, it's called the discount window, which are actually going to get rid of the stigma of the discount window to help banks better uh, stay capitalized. But the, whenever mm -hmm. the fed raises rates, it is the discount window. The fed funds rate is just the rate that is that the banks use based on the discount window rate. The discount window is like the main benchmark mark. And then the Fed funds rate, basically what, um, you know, discount rate plus whatever the banks up from there. Okay. Um, All right. So, so let, let's say, no, no, it's okay. Okay. That, that gives me a second so that we can kind of clear up what we got already. Okay. So basically Powell's sticking a middle finger to the world um, in some respects, because he's raising interest rates. He's been consistent and keen on that. Um, and that's causing other banks around the world and other companies. Um, they can no longer do what they were once doing under Bernanke or Janet Yellen, because once again, they had a very, very easy money policy. Um, at, at, now I mean, they probably still have a bunch of money out there. Sure, um, but it's not as bad. Okay, but it's, like, it's so, not as much. Okay, so then, like, the next question would be, um, why don't we? Why isn't he taking action? Kind of like you know the legendary Paul Volcker that we always heard about, where you know he, he hiked. He doesn't it, have to. He okay, okay, and he, go he ahead. Doesn't have to because okay, and real like, quick for for additional context, situation. basically, um, when people talk about Paul Volcker, they look at him as kind of somebody that ran into inflation because he raised interest rates up to twenty percent. And I remember, I'm sure you remember your parents or people, you know, much older than us, saying like, "Oh my God, I couldn't imagine." You know, back in the day, I bought a house and interest rates were fifteen, twenty yeah, percent, yeah, yeah. whereas now it's it's very cheap. So, the, so the, the main the Volcker had room on the balance sheet. Volcker okay. wasn't in 30 whatever trillion dollars in it wasn't national. even a trillion right yeah. yeah yeah and so there weren't as many assets on the feds balance sheet okay pal couldn't but because we're so levered up 
raising rates to five and a half percent fuck people that much harder. Also, by hundreds of billions or maybe a hundred billion or so, give or take, QT is happening, quantitative tightening, which just means that debts mature on the Fed's balance sheet and they just roll off. So that much, like 100 billion, give or take amount of assets are maturing on the Fed's balance sheet. So the Fed's balance sheet is slowly shrinking over time. And this is tightening. And this is essentially also what higher for longer means. And it is basically the Fed saying, hey, we're not going to keep buying these assets off your, your balance sheet because we're trying to raise rates. And before mm-hmm. we... Um, we do that. We want to kind of normalize where it should be, whether it's like the 2% marker, who knows? Um, but that's essentially why Powell is able to, to do what, what he's been doing. Also the point that I had forgotten, but now just remembered is that he yeah, was able to cut. raise, he was able to raise rates. Well, he wasn't able to raise rates during 2018 and was forced to, to pivot really because he wasn't in control of the price of the, of the United States money anymore. Um, we were indexed to LIBOR. And so thankfully, I think it was all in the same year. Uh, actually, no. Uh, uh, 2022 is when all brand new debt is no longer issued to LIBOR. All that debt is now issued to SOFR, the secure overnight financing rate, backed by real, I'll call it sure, free market activity based on something real. Uh, I mean, it's called like secure, like secure thing. Just think of like collateralized. Mm-hmm. It's collateralized by U.S. domestically focused economic activity. Also something real. LIBOR was some central planning, bullshittery, arbitrary, dictated things at the city of London. And uh, because of that, now all your issued debt, uh, maybe, I don't remember calling this, but I remember Tom saying like, hey, yeah, if you, you may have gotten like a letter in the mail or an email saying, uh, from from your bank that you know all new debt is now going to be re-indexed uh, to, to sell for now. Now there are still loans that are still probably indexed to LIBOR, but the really important thing about LIBOR and what I probably should have brought up earlier is that LIBOR was the indexed index rate that euro dollars were based on. Euro dollars isn't the euro. It is that's a really bad terminology. I and Tom call it the offshore dollar market. Uh, he actually thought it was a better idea to call it the offshore dollar system. So instead of ODM, offshore dollar market, it'd be ODS because it's it sounds like it's odious, which is exactly what it was. So the off- offshore dollar system is essentially it's been around since the Marshall Plan. After we decimated Europe, flatlined everything, we had to rebuild. And then you had all this booming happening, you know, during and after the war when industrial production happened, everyone got rich. And this is why we hate the boomers because uh, they had it easy up until, uh, well, I guess they put into their pension. They're reaping the benefits from that. But uh, yeah. essentially, essentially, all of these offshore dollar loans were given to Europe and they were given dollars and they were able to use those dollars as reserves to issue more loans create more money, print more money than the Fed. The Fed actually doesn't print money. They create reserves, different fucking thing. Go fuck yourselves. Sorry, I'm a little salty. But basically, they were able to print more dollars than uh, America allowed. It was beyond America's jurisdiction. Well, actually Mm -hmm. not because we gave them those loans in the first place. But it wasn't, it it was beyond the jurisdiction of, of the Fed. And It was partially the reason for all this offshore dollar creation over time, over the years. Um, I mean, this is why people create like uh, shell corporations and or uh, shell banking uh, entities in uh, the Bahamas and and stuff. All these institutions are are just making like these shadow, these shadow dollars. That's uh, Mm -hmm. these are shadow banks, as you can uh, imagine, probably involved in funding Epstein like, or very much Epstein, uh, sort of things. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a money printer beyond the, uh, us's or the feds jurisdiction, uh, because it wasn't indexed to the, uh, an interest rate that the fed could control. And this is how you've got like George Soros being able to, uh, do cover revolutions here and, and there and all the stuff. And 
all these offshore dollars with zero interest rate policy and negative interest rate policy in the terms of Europe, it's kind of the, the these offshore dollars. And they also did things like over collateralize um, bullshit things. They called assets like, you know, David Boy Bowie saw him ropes. He's were able to be collateralized and create a lot of money off of that. These mm -hmm. kind of things paired with no interest rate policy are really what caused the, uh, the, the deck of cards to fall and ultimately right. caused the housing collapse uh, during 08. Danielle DiMartino Booth talks about this. So this offshore shadow banking system is now, thanks to Powell, it's not about inflation. Raising interest rates isn't about inflation. It's about destroying the offshore dollar system, or if not destroying it, taming it, putting it on a leash, and controlling it with SOFR. Because now all new debt is issued by a real market-based rate, domestically United America focused, United America, United States slash American focused, mm -hmm. and is not in the control of globalists anymore. And that pretty much in a shell is why we are winning financially. Okay, why... so it, now the thing I get lost on, and maybe you could elaborate on this a little bit more. Sure. Um, when I hear these explanations about Powell, um, my problem is, is like, is this him intentionally doing it? Or is this just like, hey, yeah. you know, or, or do you think he just plays politics really well? Because like when he does his speeches, yeah, he'll I, I still said he was kind a lawyer. of I said he was a lawyer earlier. He's going to use <laughs> as, as like okay. liar, as a liar. I, I'm kidding. Yeah. Like, I'm well, I'm not kidding. But look, he's he knows how to play politics is what you're saying. Yeah, he, he does. And he doesn't give mm -hmm. a fuck. Like he's going to use the bad data that his staff staff writes for him and hides behind it. Whether that's going to be CPI, whether it's going to say things like, um, uh, uh, was it? It wasn't transient inflation, was it? A uh, transitory. He kept saying Tran inflation Tran is transitory. transitory. Um, yeah, that was a famous and word. And higher for longer might even be something like that, or a soft landing. That's another thing. But mm -hmm. really, in comparison to the rest of the world, we probably will be able to pull off some sort of soft landing. You can define that in whatever term you want but to me soft landing really means bankrupting these zombie companies that only survive off of zero okay. policy okay so yeah killing, the, the killing and punishing the bad actors mm -hmm. and then once the dust settles you're able to have these um private debt deal negotiations happen in sure. the, the market and you have price discovery and that's how banks and um insurance companies and just companies in general are able to fill the holes on their balance sheet uh, because when interest rates went up, the the treasuries that they had were, um, you know, went tits up. And then if they wanted to use the BTFP, the bank term funding program facility at the Fed, then they were able to go have those. Um, oh my God, not retroactively uh, uh, revalued at par. Mm -hmm. um, but again, remember they couldn't just, that wasn't a bailout. They had to actually raise the capital to do so and pay that loan back um but uh but but for for an actual loan but still you're able to have real price discovery in the market when these institutions or that only survive under uh zero money. Yeah. are out because the main thing is after the global financial crisis happened in 2008 all of these like wildcat bankers well, i think i fucked up my camera there all these wildcat bankers that were able to make all these like bad loans to uh people for houses or whatever they were heavily regulated and so they had to take their shenanigans elsewhere and where did they go they went to the private equity markets and so that's how you have like all these silicon valley projects kind of blow up ever since then and they had a monopoly over these uh institutions that weren't able to make deals with each other in the private market so now as they go tits up then you can have actual true somewhat merited market activity now okay. it's not going to probably be willy nilly and as pretty as we think overnight but, but uh, as, as people say monetary policy happens on like a six to 12 month lag but ever okay. ever since pal's been raising like we're we're seeing things that aren't as bad as really people had thought because you know right. libertarians and others in 
that domain Bitcoiners, whatever, right. were bitching that Powell was going to break everything if he goes 1%. And here we are at five and a half. So it's just yeah. going to be a gradual sort of thing. And we're probably hiding behind very bad data. Uh, recently for February, the housing, the pur purchasing data was down like 0.3%. Uh, and so it's just like negative. So maybe that's not actually as bad as it should be in reality. Um, so whether it's that, whether it's CPI, um, whether it's the, the, the jobs numbers, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be fudged data. Uh, but that's good enough. That's what he's, yeah, that's fine because right. if inflation starts to go down, but not as down as it should. Uh, like if oil starts to keep creeping up as we're seeing it right now, because people are trying to force us to fight their World War III for them, as they have done in the past, then that's just another excuse for Powell to say, oh, yeah, we're going to keep rates high. Actually, we're going to raise them another 25 basis points, believe it or not. And I think that mm -hmm. this really helps out. This kind of gets into the PayPal mafia stuff. If anyone's been paying attention to what uh, Matt Erickson has been talking about, uh, what Pete Quinones has been talking about, and yeah. others. But this really gets into, you know, people have been kicking the can down the road or trying to pull the can back towards them on the same road mm -hmm. of when Powell's going to pivot this year. Fed governors have been saying that you can expect three cuts in interest rates over uh -huh. this past Saturday. Fed Governor Bostic, I think who's at the Atlantic Fed, I could be wrong, so don't quote me on that, said that actually you can only expect one cut because I think that people are smart enough or you know whether they be white hats or just people that are going to be honest with themselves and don't want to see America fall and are not so much the doves on the FOMC chair. They're more of the hawks like Powell. They understand that inflation is going to come back, and they also know that the more rate cuts that we give the market this year, the more money is not going to be expensive for Democrats and globalists to rig the election and try to steal it back. And that's it. That just makes financing, whether it's Biden or whatever, you know, asshole that they put to replace him, it's it's going to be more difficult for. Biden's presidency to look good if Powell doesn't cut rates. In fact, if he cuts rates after the election, like in November, um, and we already have like a Trump win by then, what Powell has done by waiting to cut is make the Democrats look bad. And start if he starts cutting during Trump's presidency and markets start to really swoon, then it's really going to make Trump out. look good. Yeah, he yeah. makes Trump look good. But of course, it's not about Trump. If you believe in the PayPal mafia theory, then I think that you, for once, actually don't have neocons behind a presidential candidate. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to dive down the, the PayPal mafia tonight. That That's I mean, that's we, we don't. But if you look at it like that's kind mm -hmm. of what's happening. You I'm I'm super I'm I'm like very 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 skeptical of like, believing. Yeah, sure, that... you 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 can be, but what mm -hmm. the point I'm trying to drive home Sorry. is that, as I said at the top of the hour, mm -hmm. is you have these political and financial actors that are seeing these inefficiencies in the economy through fake free bullshit money, yeah. dictated by globalists, and even if you're trying to run a, a company or even if you made your billions, you have a family that you're trying to raise and provide for. You want their future to look manageable and not in a civil war. Then you're going to be Machiavellian about it and take back power. And you're going to get and fund behind, get funding behind a great man, a great orange man and leverage the zealous fan base that he has for your own self-interest and i i think that's pretty much where wall street and silicon valley is based on the paper that matt had read that covers uh basically the same kind of terminology mindset from andreessen horowitz daniel Martino booth talks about how people on wall street did not make friends with the globalist Larry Fink of BlackRock because he basically undermined the primary dealers that get first dibs access to the Fed window when they issue treasuries at auction. And he, through the CARES Act with BlackRock, got the same privileges as any major primary dealer did. 
And he basically like won up to all of Wall Street and he made them invest in their DEI shit and ESG shit. And what have we seen the past couple of years? We are seeing people pull all their funds out of that. Um, and it's the people in Silicon Valley and Wall Street that are seeing the inefficiencies of ESG and DEI and how they have all this pork and and just bullshit that is not making it's not uh, making anybody money. business operational yeah. sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So and so what we have is just a political faction of similar interests, not of the same ideology, but same mm -hmm. like mental rational projection of the pendulum needs to swing, and we need to fix shit now. So that's where we see it. You don't need to go all autistic about the who's linked to who in the PayPal mafia, whether or not he's a globalist or not. It's just out of rational instinct. And Curtis Yarvin made the argument that it's good that we had that we had Biden win in 2020 because the world was not ready, especially during times of COVID uh, and the summer of George, as Pete likes to call it. I do if like that if Trump had won, it would have actually maybe have been a civil war. So we needed the bullshit mockery of the left and open criticism of Zionism kind of unfold and hit the zeitgeist over this four, these four years of Biden. And now people enough are fed up at all levels, mm -hmm. all tax brackets, maybe not all, I don't know. But it's now very much in the cultural zeitgeist to make the same points that Nick Fuentes does and realize that I don't want this kind of stuff being taught at if, if my, my, my child. Like I, I, as a parent, need to get on the school board. I need to make a change. Sure. All this is being, uh, coming from from it's being cut from the same cloth of just evil frankly and so everyone in every industry that has rational mind is just trying to take back power and move it in a different direction okay all right all right well that that was a uh a rabbit hole that i wasn't planning on going down but that, that that's all, all good connected. stuff no, I, I I I believe it, but I think some of the stuff to me reads as wild optimism, and I, I think a lot of people tend to project their hopes and dreams. You don't need to call the them Trump. white hats. No, just, no, no, it's it's, it's, it's not about that. Sense. It's not about, okay, okay, okay. So where I wanted to go next was um, when it comes to Powell sticking it to the European Union and all that stuff. It's basically like the U.S. is going to be more solvent than the European countries, right? Yeah. So the idea is that if you can, it, the U.S. is able to stay solvent longer than those countries can because we have more assets and we're a more, you know, robust nation that's more productive. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess one thing that I also wanted to kind of discuss with you was uh, where BRICS plays into all this because we know that you know China, Iran, and Russia are all kind of building their parallel mm -hmm. economy to this, and um, I'm. I'm familiar ish with china's economic status like we know that they're in a lot of hot water when it comes to economics but at the same time it, it's so hard to tell because we have a lot of propaganda here um, yeah. when it comes to china but like their country itself is doing pretty well for the people at least for the times that they have right now but we also know about like their real estate kind of situation where they build these ghost cities and yeah. turn them down. Can I go on a quick but, tangent about the real estate? I mean, okay, it's really yeah, yeah. Cool. So, so go ahead, do, do go on a tangent about that and then kind of uh, connect it, it, bricks all into this. Yeah. It, um. So I'm not as much of like the geopolitical analyst as I probably should be. You know, I just pick up sure. little highlights of shit people say and I piece it together and I'm like, oh, this makes complete total fucking sense. Mm -hmm. The whole thing with Evergrande and China's real estate market I think was a tactic to get globalist Soros name, whatever NGO or similar actor at hand to get their money and collapse it. Because okay. what that was, was global soft power control. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a similar strategy that Putin did when he kicked all out all the oligarchs through changing policy and mm -hmm. saying you can keep your riches but you just can't be influential in our government and so having control of the real estate market and people will probably like fight back and say oh well what about like the uh C confucius institute is that what the fuck it's called and all the chinese sure. real estate um infiltrating the the U u.s like Sure, there's probably like Chinese globalists and some of them might actually be communists. But I think that 
uh, communism is more of like a nominal term for the Chinese and just the global South Asian company. Uh, not, uh, Asian they're country not really in like general. communists in the no, classical definition anymore at all, that, actually. Uh, Tom makes the argument. I think he got this from someone else, too, mm -hmm. that these countries, Russia, they've been around for centuries. We're right. a fucking little shit stain on the global map of countries in existence. The United States is. And so we base the survival of our country uh, on a system of government. Mm -hmm. They're not a system. They are a people first. Correct. Because they've been around, like you said, Blood they've been soil. around for so long. This is what yes. we are. We are a culture. Correct. We're going to try to preserve this as much as possible. And we're willing to change our system if it calls for such thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the G government might look, you know, less authoritarian, whatever. I mean, the same kind of like surveillance state is really what they want in Europe through, with their EU globalist kind of 1984 thing. They probably had the Chinese try to outsource it first as, you know, lab, a lab test sort of thing. But to go back to the Ever, Evergrande thing, I, I think it was just the collapse and destruction of economic soft power control. And there were just a bunch of oligarchs that parked their, their cash over there. And it was a way to get out from underneath that that control and to embrace uh, monetary financial sovereignty to, to some extent. Like, yeah, it probably hurt China uh, a good bit. Like, I'm I'm not like the the China hawk, and I'm also not keen on on China e economic policy. So, I'm mean, that's kind of frankly, I'll admit as far as I can kind of go with that. But I okay. think what they're they're doing. As far as their uh, Belt and Road Initiative, kind of replacing the IMF as a financing solution for all these other other countries, mm, um, partnering with, with with Russia, maybe being a little bit too dependent on on them for trading resources and whatnot. Well, yeah, okay. So, China, when it comes to China's economy, though, they're very very dependent on imports. So, like, they import yeah. billions of food from the U.S. Um, and then when it comes to, like the Belt and Road Initiative in Africa, they're charging these countries like very very low interest. They're forgiving some of the loans. Yeah, and they're building up a lot of like good political capital. Yeah, but at the same like, time, there, there, there could be there could be some larger plan that is nefarious. I don't know though, and I'm like, yeah, I don't it, know. Though. I don't think that that yeah. really makes rational sense for them because the chinese and other people right. in that part of the world just think very long term uh i don't know if it's well like yeah exactly i never yeah. got around to read slash listen to the art of war i know i probably should but it's just very much <laughs> Me neither, you're good. that long game strategic like yeah. crouching tiger hidden fucking whatever um yeah. but that that's essentially kind of kind of where it's at because if they build relations with those countries that's good for the long term they have access to those resources Mm -hmm. and uh i mean yeah <laughs> okay okay yeah that, that's i th that's kind of like i focus a lot they're on also on this show. they're also um that when they they used to give out loans in dollars and now they're giving out loans in in yen so that okay. for one would make the 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 demand for yen and the yen value stronger as well so right. there's that and also to add on to what Tom and another guy uh, named Vince Blanchy, I forget what his uh, Twitter handle is. Uh, he goes by VBL uh, Sorens think synth. I don't know. If you just type in like Vince Blanchy or whatever in Spotify, you'll, you'll find him. Mm -hmm. um, he's at Tom. Uh, he's been on Tom's podcast, and they kind of make the argument that uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head around exactly what like, like what mercantilism is because. The way I understand it, someone can like fact check me. Kyle can Google it, but the way That's I understand what I'm doing it, right now, <laughs> the way the way I understand it is that you create economic activity within your country only. It's kind of like a nationalist uh, economic approach, and you don't trade with anyone else because you don't want to be dependent on anyone else. And it was mercantilism. Mercantilism was kind of bastardized in the way that the British Empire did it. With countries in Africa or anywhere else, like the United States, for that matter, is that it was mercantilism, but for the sake of one country uh, at the disadvantage of the other country. So mm -hmm. we would farm our cash crops in the colonies, and it would most of the profits and product would go back to the UK, and then we would get you know whatever tiny percentage of the shit back to us. 
And so that was one of the things that sparked the American Revolution in the first place. And I think that we're moving more towards that as far as China goes and the global south goes. Because if you look at gold, the gold market, uh, the exchanges, you have the LME, the London Mercantile Exchange, and you have uh, the CME, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Hi, uh, Kyle's wife or whoever's in the background. <laughs> that, that was my, my dog was running out. To oh. go to, uh, my, my wife was calling the dog over. <laughs> oh, doggy. Yeah. Doggos. Love doggos. I have a, I have a, that's Mochi. Uh, yeah, well, my... My uh, anyway. yeah, he was just so my uh, mini pin will sometimes come in. My pit bull should normally sit like right here, and then my Doberman Australian Shepherd mix. If you look at my one podcast I did recently, he literally puked right by me. It smelled so no. bad, and I I couldn't stop to clean it up. Okay, so basically, um, anyway, so I'm gonna wrap up on the mercantile. Yeah, no, thing. that's okay. Yeah, so go this ahead. Is how like these global like South countries are gonna work together for their financial sovereignty, but also force America or Wall Street as I like to call the rational economic like white hat thinkers to work with them. So what Tom and Vince is really more Vince's idea, how they, what they lay out is that if you look at the gold markets and all the gold exchanges, all of it, the gold is being liquidated. They're kind of having like a run on the exchanges with gold because mm -hmm. they don't want to put all that trust and power in those countries. Into the, it, um, so, Basically, they're fucking over like London and trying to fuck over the U.S. London Mercantile Exchange was the global South countries are trying to fuck over the U.S. Yeah, they're just European. trying okay. to take all their gold back, just like Charles sure. de Gaulle did with us in in the seventies and called Nixon's mm -hmm. bluff and you know gold window all that kind of shit. Yeah. Um, so basically, they're they're kind of doing that, and they are basically trying to be uh, the net exporters of uh, said gold. Uh, if you want gold. You're gonna have to go buy from China, and China's gonna have all this gold production. Uh, people always like to talk about how much gold China's been buying over the years, and yada yada. And they essentially want to. Um, if you become the sole producer, then you get to be the sole um, price setter of said commodity. And people always like to give J.P. Morgan shit on fucking with the futures markets of gold and. And manipulating the gold price uh, lower than it should be. Mm. Now, others like myself and my colleagues in Tom's uh, private Slack group, uh, shout out Book of Cyril. Others like to make the argument that, well, we're dealing with we're in different times, and the Fed might actually let the price of gold monetize and go up to help the banks out. Uh, with their balance sheets and fill those holes. But that's another tangent, which we're going to save till th at the end of this conversation because it kind of puts the icing on the cake of how we kind of fix all this shit financially for the sake of uh, America, but the rest of the world. Because China already kind of um, have been uh, playing with the solution. Um, but anyway, China, any other global south country, anyone else trying to liquidate uh the gold exchanges take the gold back do a run on gold on the exchanges and house the gold themselves as they keep producing it if you're doing that as china then you are you have all your gold in-house and you're also a net producer and exporter if you want gold and you're not producing it you're going to go to either china or the u.s uh but let's say that jamie diamond wants to uh for like whatever reason we're not producing much gold in the united states i don't really know like where gold's really produced i would heard like africa uh china like russia whatever i don't really know how much of it is produced here but sure. that aside my that set my ignorance aside for a sec let's just mm -hmm. use this example that jamie diamond wants to uh you know that's just buy gold from china be like hey well i want to set up shop in china i want to set up a gold production shop in china china's like all right, we'll do a partnership, but you need to follow our rules and uh, you can sell it to your market people in the US, but uh, maybe you got to go through like our exchange or like use our platform and exchange in China uh, as like the, the gold market. So essentially, it's kind of like a return to mercantilism, the same thing that uh, the British Empire was forcing upon the, the colonies. Um, now, I don't think that China would rape and pillage uh, as far as like taking the 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 vig or or the cut, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, whether it be like uh, production fees or whatever, but essentially it's it's pulling back 
uh, financial, economic sovereignty, abiding by China's rules, and just buffering them as more of a e economic, uh, acting, operating country. And they have their financial sovereignty, and they're able to negotiate deals with other people that want to to work with them. But in in, in a sense, it's just like very kind of like China like tight niche, and it, it's just another like business opportunity for someone like Jamie Diamond to do go up. Go over there, set up shop, and uh, drill or mine gold in China. Have their operation, but you know, be paying taxes to China. Pay those taxes, perhaps in yen, uh, to help strengthen the yen. Mm -hmm. And um, is it yen in China? I always forget what it is. For I moment. always it's forget for Japan. too. No, no, it's uh, the Japanese yuan. It, I think it's the oh, Chinese. Yeah. You want you want yen, whatever. But you you basically see what what I'm saying here. Global South countries are gonna gonna try to do these mercantilist type scenarios to basically make their their economies more prosperous and sound. And rational actors on Wall Street that see the opportunity will mm -hmm. go set up shop there and just follow their rules and and pay the the fines and whatever to that country and and pay the make those payments in uh in the uh in that um, local currency mm -hmm. and but then i think they'll eventually settle those transactions in gold or okay. whatever other commodity and so, so yeah that, that's this, this opens up the i i know you you have a point but this kind of like nicely segues into oh, go ahead, go ahead. that thing i i mentioned yeah the utilization of gold or commodity backed currencies kind of trampling springboards us to you know how do we fix this whole economic catastrophe that we have on our hands and you you do that by what's famously called uh or tom likes to call throwing gold out onto the yield curve and i don't know if he coined that phrase but this idea is not uh new it is novel in the sense that I think people before Judy Shelton uh, came up with this, but essentially Judy Shelton was supposed to be promoted to the F FOMC board under Trump. And from what I understand, globalist powers got in the way and uh, didn't want to have her on the board and have her proposed solution. Her solution was that the United States government would issue treasury bonds, 50 hundred years of length duration whatever and part of those bonds of the coupons because when you like buy a bond uh you are the creditor of that government or even company uh etns exchange traded notes are essentially the same thing when companies go and they issue their debt and you are the creditor of that company or government and you put up that money and you expect a certain uh, amount of biannual or uh, se semi-annual interest uh, in coupons from mm -hmm. your investment. Um, so basically a fraction of those coupons would be paid out in bullion. And this is a similar, uh, policy that RFK juniors campaign was, was uh, proposing because mm -hmm. yeah, what, if you read on Bitcoin magazine, they were <laughs> fucking Bitcoin magazine always, like blows your load and freaks out over any politician that like says something nice about Bitcoin and just tries to sell it's, whatever it's shitty clickbait yeah. argument and article uh, for clicks and stuff. But um, I think uh, Ryan Dawson tries to like debunk this, but this is similar to what JFK I think proposed with uh, silver notes, uh, mm -hmm. like remonetizing silver. You're basically letting the price of uh, monetary metals go up and you issue debt based on those notes because part of the the coupon payment the interest payment that you get twice a year is going to be paid out in, in bullion and this could be backed by uh gold or it could be a basket of commodities and i firmly believe that bitcoin is going to be included in that basket the fed does not hate bitcoin um jerome powell has said two things. One's going to go back to the mer mercantilism thing that I just talked about. It relates to that in a sense because one pal said that there is more room for just one world reserve currency. The dollar does not have to be that because everyone is joining BRICS because they've been 
they're just tired of being fucked over by weaponized monetary policy against them. Mm-hmm. And Powell gets that and he's like, yeah, we'll have this like mercantilist shop and we'll, uh, you know, pay those fees for business operations in the local currency that we establish, whatever corporation that we set up there. And um, so he's okay with like somewhat de dollarization. But don't believe the bullshit articles that you see on Zero Hedge or RT or wherever about de-dollarization happening and Armageddon is going to come and everyone's going to leave the dollar and it's going to hyperinflate and go to shit. And people's not, people aren't going to want the dollar. That's completely fucking horseshit. Every global country is going to buy U.S. debt, especially if they start buying long bonds that are pay, backed essentially by a commodity like gold, Bitcoin, or whatever else, oil. Mm. Um, so that's essentially... Why this fixes everything is because one, again, it's all about trust, right? Mm-hmm. And just full faith and credit in an in institution. Going back to the whole FDIC thing, why uh, Powell did the bailout, why anyone in, tr- in control of the greatest nation in the world's economy's monetary policy does a bailout is to provide credibility in that nation. So mm-hmm. <laughs> if there is just utterance that this is going to happen but hasn't yet it's all about capital flight and another giant that i stand on the shoulders of is martin armstrong you can google his uh uh, documentary that someone did on him very interesting i'm not going to go into it but he's all about global capital flight because once you see that capital moves from one country to the other something crazy is going to happen whether it's going to be a war or a financial crisis like whatever sort of thing but um it's all about liquidity and capital being drained out of one country or currency to the other mm-hmm. and people move their money from euros to dollars or whatever the, the currency is because they have faith in it that they can make more money off of that uh one one indicator of global capital flight has been the dow now there are other naysayers and i kind of agree i see their point that the, the dow is a bad indicator of this because the dow is just indexed by like the top blue chip companies that kind of hold it up and those companies aren't really going to go tits up anytime soon and but uh just one measurement of if the dow keeps going up uh significantly is if a bunch of uh capital outside of the u.s kind of goes in there but uh my friend book of does I think rightfully so make the argument that all of this outside capital has already kind of parked itself there. But again, one way that you can kind of read where things are going is if you track the, uh, the Euro, what is priced at uh, in terms of like, you know, dollars. Um, if you go to in real time right now, investing.com, I have this pulled up, bear with me. I can't uh, see. Hold so on, the, Euro, the Euro is at a dollar, uh, eight dollar and eight cents and um technically it's in the green so it's moved uh oh no it's in the red right now and oh, then hold on we- hold on i i got it i got it i got it i got it let me put it on screen so the way that i look at this and the way i think tom kind of looks at it is just kind of like back up on <laughs> look at look look at times on when the euro goes down and when the dollar goes up that's people losing faith in um in uh how how things are going economically okay uh, in in europe and um and they just like park their their money into in, into dollars as the safe haven okay. so i mean that's not like the best tried and true indicator of ca- capital flight but that's just for instance one thing that i kind of look at and then um look at that i mean the, the thing about europe is that they don't have collateral and they depend on people like Russia for their oil and they uh, they aren't they're being forced by their EU commies and government to do all the, this green policy for, you know, Project 2020, which was originally 2030. Now it might have to be pushed out to 2050. Like I would never really spurred out on that like conspiracy shit. But essentially, uh Europe is going to go tits up because they really don't stand on any resources and they depend on everything else like uh, Russia. And this goes back to the British Empire thing. Like all these European countries were like, I I firmly believe as Richard Poe and others uh, demonstrate is that the French Revolution was Mm -hmm. done by the British Empire, overthrown uh, uh, a grassroots movement of like 
French sovereignists were probably co-opted and taken over by British interests, similar MI6 tactics that were exported to the CIA. And that's why, again, it's always been the British Empire behind the scenes and not really the US. The US is just kind of like their uh their cover they hide behind. But um you have all these European countries that are trying to fight for their globalism versus the British Empire's globalism backed by neocons. And so what you have is that the McKinder Heartland theory has been an extension from today of British imperial foreign policy. And mm-hmm. Kyle, if you want to pull this up, just Google McKinder Heartland theory. It's basically this geographer, this British geographer in the early 1900s uh, proposed that. Okay. He- yeah, yeah, you know what? I, I remember hearing you talk about this. Okay. So real quick, let me read this just so that way the listeners who may not see this are all tuned in and you can add as necessary. McKinder thought that whoever controlled the Eastern Europe, the heartland would control the world. Uh, the idea was that whoever gained control of the Eastern Europe controlled the heartland also known as the pivot area and could, um, and whoever controlled the heartland could easily gain control of the world island, Africa and Eurasia. Okay. Yeah. Um. So this is why they, why the globalists in Europe and I, I'm just going to really focus on the neocons because the yeah. the the greeny type European Union people aren't exactly on the same globalist uh, wavelength as the the British Empire mm-hmm. as it exists today because they're actually willing to work with Iran. Like Tom makes the yeah. argument that Obama was actually backed by Davos, like EU globalist European Empire, and not the British neocon Empire. Uh, that like backed Bush and his cabinet because Obama is one that passed the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. And mm-hmm. that like Iran being able to be energy efficient and independent, that just opens up more deals that uh, Europe can make and not have to be so reliant on Russia, an enemy that they, they see. But the true enemy of Russia is is the british empire that's why you go back uh like centuries as richard poe and others richard poe most nominally um he's a really great like jewish historian he was actually on uh, glenn beck's team and was fired from glenn beck because the series that glenn beck would fucking do on his chalkboard at fox news was naming the jew too hard like it was basically exposing soros too much and i and I'm only going to pull strings and guess that uh, they probably had a huge share in Fox News. Well, yeah, Glenn Beck is a is a huge fervent Zionist. In fact, when October oh, yeah. 7th broke totally. out, yeah, when October but, 7th but, broke but, out, but, he would say, so, sign me up to go fight for Israel. But what's interesting is that this kind of lays out some of the nuance of, you know, what Jew like stands on like what Jew side and how I, I think Richard Poe is very interesting. He kind of takes like a very neutral approach. Like, yeah, he is like ethnically uh, Ukrainian. So I think he brings mm-hmm. a unique perspective. He kind of scapegoats behind like blam- bl- blaming everything on the, the British empire, where as I made the argument, it's probably still like Rothschild and other uh, old, you know, Jewish central banking money still backing it. But I think he does make a very fair and clear uh, argument for why it's been the British that have been head to head with the Russians uh, going back to St. Peter and overthrowing St. Petersburg. But he lays out in uh, an article that he wrote on Substack and he's done interviews about this, but he lays out in his article, uh, I think it's titled how the British invented communism, how the British empire invented communism and blamed it on the Jews, which I think is a little insincere, but he does lay out good points like geographically, like at a nation state level, the British empire is still backed by Jews and Jewish money, Rothschilds, whatever. But how, (laughs) but how the British empire was always at heads with Russia and look where we are today. Look where we've been for decades. As far as the, the cold war goes, how the neocons to some point won the cold war because it was their oligarchs that took over after the Soviet Union collapsed. And then they just put in a set of, of new actors to, uh, of oligarchs off of wall street, uh, Bill Browder, um, Alex Craner wrote a great book about Bill Browder and exposing all of this, 
Wall Street um, Zionist esque like oligarchy that was running the uh, the Russian government and doing the the shock treatment of capitalism and the loan sh- loans for shares uh, shitty chicanery market uh, you know shit coining I'll call it for lack mm-hmm. of better words but um, they won up until Putin came in and as uh, I had um, Joaquin Flores on my show uh, over a year. I, actually, I think two years ago from now, about now, um, he he says that Vladimir Putin was part of the uh, KGB, but like a certain faction within the KGB, as he like poetically, beautifully says, mm-hmm. he was protected in this hermetically sealed unit within the KGB that was basically like Russia first, and they were just waiting for him to school up on you know uh, intelligence stuff. Uh, business, foreign relations, uh, international law and policy, and able to kind of the, throw him in when the time was m- most ripe to be like a Russian nationalist. And there, as we see, um, he's kind of been like the monarch ever since. You can believe right. that uh, his voting favorability is bullshit or not, but... Uh, Doesn't change the facts on the ground. Exactly. I don't really know how uh, we got to talking about Putin. If you want to bring it back to to, to Earth for me, or if you want to no, just end, the, end the show here, we can do that too. No, dude, you're you're good. You you're like the Scott Horton of uh, monetary <laughs> policy. You know, what, maybe high Tom, praise, Tom, brother. High praise. <laughs> okay, well, maybe it's uh, uh, Tom Luongo's the Scott Horton, and then you're the Connor Freeman. Which, if you don't know who Connor sure, Freeman is, okay. yeah, no, no, Connor's a really really good friend of mine. He's he, he's like the next scott horton i or or he's gonna be the next connor freeman because he's so damn knowledgeable on the stuff he's been on the show a bunch of times just scott's great by the way like i i I met him in person like i've been on his boat i uh intern or like part-time work for the institute like posting editing editing oh no way yeah it didn't last very long one i was kind of like fucking up because i was only doing it like part-time and i would like easily make like mistakes my my famous mistake that i will like live by is that someone well, like sending an article for the Institute and like, mm-hmm. I would like copy and paste it in like the WordPress behind the scenes and let like, hit publish. So, um, it was something about like Thomas Massey doing something like totally Chad. And, uh, um, in the title, I, it was, it was published as Thomas massive. <laughs> it was, <laughs> but, uh, I basically, right. I wasn't able to like put all like my time and effort and focus into it. And so, uh, we, we parted ways, but I've got like nothing, but good things to say about uh, Scott and the Institute. I wouldn't be schooled up on like Zionism and stuff and foreign policy uh, without him. In fact, the first time that he went on, um, I, I would, when he was writing his, um, uh, one of the books wasn't enough already. Um, yeah, I think it, okay. one was enough already published. 2021 2020 okay. i can't remember yeah like exactly. i was one of the the dudes in like his uh reddit group where i would like take notes and like send him and have them be helpful as reference i hope he used some of my shit i don't know but uh i got like super autistic about the stuff he was talking about because i would go yeah. uh, listen to i listened to to the first episode of the bob murphy show where bob had on uh had scott on and i would literally like timestamp like in a word document and like copy paste like word for word of like what scott said like i would be writing transcripts before like ai and shit was around Mm -hmm. and that was like the how we got into this mess thing and i still have it like saved in my pages like in the cloud and i like will go read that like word by word again verbatim as just like a refresher of like how did the terror war start and end again and whose fault was what and um so yeah scott has just been such a gem and Absolutely. for for his his work to be able to right reach the masses to go on uh, uh tiny hat pools show and also make appearances on on Fox <laughs> and stuff, um, it, it's kind of funny. Like whenever people post about it, like I like someone like you or or Pete will post something like shooting on Tim Pool. I'm just like it's kind of funny how like, over time I think Tim's hat's getting smaller. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> oh. T- <laughs> I'm proud of that one. I think that no, no, that's, that, that's good. That's good. That's beautiful. Uh, Phil, I appreciate all your knowledge, man. You're like a fucking 
a car a corvette that's going 100 miles an hour i can't fucking keep up with you so we'll have to have another conversation sometime yeah um eddie Grimm said it was a banger i'm sorry kevin um he he said your uh take on evergreen was optimistic but we can get into that some other time all right we'll have Um, fun being black pill dude (laughs) no kevin's a really really optimistic you can fucking hate jamie diamond right and Mm. you could you could blame him for eating up all these other banks and shit people are probably going to keep losing their jobs Mm. and chase is fixing on opening up 500 more branches and hiring 3,500 more people the next three years. Maybe that puts some banks out of business. Uh, but what you can take away is that money is going to have a fucking price and the globalists that you hate so much just based on like the numbers and interest rates going up. Uh, uh, and if Christine Lagarde and other like Ursula von der Leyen or people at the UN are the first ones to bitch at Powell in a Reuters article saying that he needs to lower rates. Uh, he's pissing off the right people. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like uh, again, uh, the, these people that probably people, people like you and, and Pete and others bitch about, about being black pilled like go hide in a bunker. Like good, go fuck yourselves and just bitch about it and be sad. <laughs> or you can, just work on your local communities and like, I don't have like capital or anything and I don't really hold much clout and I just have like a roommate and like a condo. And I, unfortunately I have a part-time job because of like my situation because the company I worked at banked with Silicon Valley bank, they went to it's up fired like 90% of our pe- of the people there. Then I had to like find like a part-time job at a, a bank of all places, but I'm willing to stick with them. <laughs> I'm going to, to stick with them and I want to get like licensed up and uh, stay with them for as long as, as possible. Uh, Cause I am actually one of the people that like kind of work in um, uh, like personal banking that Finance, kind of shit yeah. about what's going on. But um, like that aside, what I was uh, going off on is that like, you can choose to be black pilled or you can choose to be optimistic and take the realistic approach that, yeah, we life does kind of go in cycles and to get a little esoteric or uh, or es- eschatological, um, don't buy into the bullshit that like people like Donnie Darko tried to sell you that Trump or Elon is the Antichrist, and oh they're going to build the third temple and blah, blah blah. Like sure maybe they will. And yeah, uh, and yeah. Happens, I think what, what am I? Fire and what, brimstone is going to come bash it over. But regardless, like don't try to play God. Uh, well, okay, so I mean, yeah, like really, when it comes to, like the Donnie Darko and the people playing Trump up to be an antichrist, like, like this is kind of what I mean. Movie. This is like, the same thing with the PayPal mafia. For you to think when the rapture, right. which the rapture is not in the fucking Bible, in the first place, like that's another like Jew Judaizing heresy that has infiltrated Christianity. But um, thanks to like you know Schofield and Darby and all those faggots, but that's just. <laughs> Like, don't buy the doom and gloom bullshit that people are trying to sell to you because that's just essentially what they are doing. They're trying to profit off of you, and they are, as Tom calls, anxiety pimps that profit off of your anxiety. And they just want to yeah. keep selling this. That, that would be a tiny, like tiny hat and Fox News yeah. Everyone else has done. Tiny and hat now Tim. it's being trickled out into zero hedge of all places. And yeah. people are like uh, they're going to host Twitter spaces with like thousands of views. And 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 uh, participants or whatever are doing the same thing. Like, just don't buy into it. Don't be the useful idiot. Just and you don't need to like have a niche interest in the shit like I do. I'm mm. a fucking weirdo. Like, I'm a just like mid average IQ midwit that just finds this stuff somewhat enlightening. And I don't expect everybody to believe me. But mm. again, you can just. Take my word for it or not, but I mean, at least like consider it and then consider everything around you. But at the end of the day, just do what you can to preserve your capital and your friends and family around you. And I agree with Pete and others that are like hopping and, you know, kind of like what must be done. But I think yeah. other people at the Helms of Power are also thinking about what must be done and the rationality that there needs to be a, a, a turning point of political change. And I think yeah. that's that's what's happening, and it could be terrible. Like we could have like, uh, you know, Curtis Yarvin esque like, uh, CEO monarchy, and it could be completely shit. But honestly, I think that shit's gonna taste better than 
the shit that yeah would be oh, okay hard. so like a lot of people are talking about christian nationalism now and i've i've said it that like it's, i think christian nationalism is probably preferable to what we have now and yeah, i'm agnostic so it. it's 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 not yeah it, but like when it comes to like the donnie darko and this whole paypal mafia thing i think they're both one end of the spectrum or the other and you know that that's you not know, a if, fair if, argument if, no, I, I, I think it is. And I think this is just because people love Trump because he's hilarious. I think yeah. people have either project all their hopes and dreams onto him or they project all their, you know, fears and catastrophes onto him. Yeah. He, at the end of the well, day, he's just a Trump, dude who respect. already, who already failed us in 2020. I don't envision him. I, I don't have any hope for Trump in 2024. The uh, only again, thing it, I have hope for him actors about, behind yeah. him. Again, they're not neocons. Believe but it or he's, not, he's too dumb. Involved. He's too dumb to take well, a, yeah, that's, a word from there. No, book. no, he's he's taking orders. Like that's why he's saying the shit that Vivek says. Like that's why he's being he's having meetings with Vivek. I, I mean, I, I would I would need to see more. I, I I just have he's still praying around Lindsey Graham. Venture capitalists pump yeah. up his like uh uh spec to help pay for um his like bullshit like criminal charges that they're trying to get for like wrongly uh valuing the real estate that he borrowed against decades ago or whenever yeah. the fuck it was well, well like, like i said he's, there's he's a lot that i need to learn i need to catch up with matt um matt erickson's live streams on this but uh, i but, i, I but, think like, it's wild just, optimism just just to, to you know tie bow on on the whole trump thing it's not trump sure. that you should put your faith in and i won't even say put faith in but there are people behind trump that yeah saw saw a the political advantage of hey this the, the, the let's corner this guy that the majority of americans are rationally going to vote for because they hate the shit that they had to deal with under biden and during covid and so we have all so this venture back, who, we who have all this venture back happen. money and we have people <laughs> hold on we have all this venture back money and the heritage foundation to get behind him and like other actors like people like jamie diamond and wall street said oh nikki hey was a dumb cunt we can't put our money behind her anymore because that's fucking like dead in the water so rationally we're gonna get behind trump and so not only that but you have the 2025 project funded by the heritage foundation and probably some other think tanks that are hiring and some of our uh, fellow travelers and mutuals are probably enrolled into this program but what it is, is essentially it's kind of like a schooling um uh uh uh, uh journeyman apprenticeship that millennials zoomers are being put into uh through think tanks and they are basically learning how to uh essentially how to do machiavellianism one-on-one for like an american america first movement how to not get shadow banned and censored on the internet how to uh kind of cut out uh, bureaucratic inefficiencies, how to get control of different agencies within the government, because this is the same strategy that happened during Obama and probably before that, because no matter if there was a Republican or Democrat as president, president, the deep state still controlled the other agencies behind it. So this is like a new faction of deep staters, if you will. But again, they're taking like an America first approach that's probably what they're going to use as a marketing strategy and they may not be america first but they're america let's clean this shit up so my vc fund can look better and we don't have to waste time and resources on dei esg bullshit and we can have better capital markets and get some policy that are going to benefit corporations essentially so again it's just rationality call it a white pill call it too optimistic I just think that's mm. the realistic approach that is is happening. Whether or not it's successful, who fucking knows? But I just think it is a flavor. It is a, um, it, it's just a, um, a, a theory that's having light, not as shown on it as it should. Mm. Or it is getting a lot of light and traction on it based on people making the internet circles. But uh, it's it's challenging the zeitgeist, but also changing it because you got yeah. more and more people. The markets are an example of taking pals higher for longer policy seriously for once. So right. anyway, that's, that's my story for now. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> nice rock and roll well um if that all does play out i i, I think it's probably more preferable to the uh as they call it the globo homo um 
empire that we have going on now. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm still skeptical, but um, it's not it just, be. yeah, I'm skeptical of everything. So that's just within my nature. Uh, Phil, go ahead, give your plugs and we'll close this one out. Yeah. And just, just so that I'll say, don't make perfect the enemy of the good right. or good enough or decent. Mm. But yeah, uh, Kyle, this has been awesome. Appreciate your time and patience with me and uh, my neuroticism and my autism. But yeah, guys, uh, again, my name is Phil Gibson. You can see it. Right. I'm going to try to do the thing because they can see the name where it's a. Uh, yeah, you got it. Like the Disney ball bouncing on the like song. Yeah. Thing. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, what's up, guys? My name's Phil. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, please. Uh, I think I'm Shadow Band. Not to like throw out like the Sam Parker too. So like, oh, the Zion is Shadow Band. Me, blah blah blah. I think everyone's kind of fucked by this, especially after October seventh. So if you want to help me out, you can uh, follow me in my musings. I like to also shit post from time to time, but then also spark out about the Fed. So you can give me a follow. Uh, any questions you you want, you have, you can shoot me DMs. Uh, got any ideas you want to throw my way? Happy to collab. Uh, happy to go on your shows whatever uh just you know shoot the shit but yeah it's mr sue m-r-p-s-e-u Substack is link in bio but it's q paul again q p o l stands for quiet parts out loud i tried to do one article a month i'd like to wait a month digest some of the info give kind of like a recap where i think i'm going where things are going and then i try to have like one podcast media content interview type type thing for at least um each month uh i haven't interviewed anyone so i'll probably just uh link this interview in there for that content Go so ahead. cross posting yeah uh, and then if you like musical fusion uh like i was i was saying to to kyle same thing with with my uh podcast if you want to call it that i use my own intro music um on there yeah, music is uh, my first passion so if you just go to phil gibson bandcamp uh you can listen to my my stuff on there it's a uh, ep if you want lp i don't know it's got like eight tracks but some of them are like throwaways but it's called a um something some uh oh my god i forgot the thing something somewhere <laughs> sometime i think it's called i named it something somewhere sometime and you gotta check out all those uh songs most notably, the song that I called ETF, which stood for End the Fed. But I wrote it four years ago. And look where we are now. I'm just a fucking lying, bullshit, <laughs> son of a bitch. You fucking grifter. All right, Phil. Thank you so well, much. Well, if I'd be it. grifting, I would actually try to sell the End the Fed thing. Because uh, Zero Hedge and the like are the ones that are the real grifters, if you think about it. Nice. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time. Oh, episode 300. That's coming up this Friday. I promise you guys do not want to miss that. I'll be way better than this one. <laughs> It'll be a lot shorter, unfortunately. I, yeah. I wish I could get uh my my guest for episode three hundred. Well, the dude uh, was pretty generous one. with the time that he allotted uh certain large figures on uh the recent appearances that he's been on, like okay. like two hours or or some nearly. Was it so really? You might, you might luck out. Okay, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll drop a little hint. I may have given it away anyway. No, 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 no. I, I don't know if you did or didn't, but uh. Um, well, he, he gave like Tucker like two hours, apparently. Was it really? Okay, because the I clip that was it. posted wasn't that long. At least the clip that was shared to Twitter. Dude, we so spoiled it. Anyway. <laughs> All right, everybody. Till Friday. Thank you guys so much. We should go check out Phil's stuff.